Lower Limb Biomechanics The key to lower limb biomechanics is that to understand and treat faulty foot function, we must first understand normal foot function. The human foot is a complex structure of bones, joints, muscles and ligaments. The foot can be divided into three sections, the forefoot, the midfoot and the rear foot. The forefoot comprises the first to fifth metatarsal bones and phalanges. The midfoot comprises of the navicular and the cuboid plus the medial, intermediate and lateral cunei forms. The rear foot is made up of the calcaneus and talus. The subtalar joint. The main joint of concern in foot biomechanics is the subtalar joint, which is the joint between the calcaneus or heel bone and the talus. The proper function of this joint is crucial to a correct and pain-free gait. Motion of the rear foot. Triplane motion is the movement of the foot through three planes, i.e. three-dimensional. Sagittal plane, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, frontal plane, inversion and eversion, transverse plane, adduction and abduction. To understand the biomechanics of the foot and motion of the foot, we must firstly understand motion in the three cardinal planes, being the sagittal plane, the frontal plane, and the transverse plane. Now, to give you an example of motion in the sagittal plane, which is in this direction, we commonly get motion, which we call dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot, this upwards and downwards movement is motion in the sagittal plane. Now next we can talk about motion in the frontal plane which is in this direction and that's more when we get inversion and eversion of the foot. It's movement in the frontal plane moving inwards and outwards of the foot. Now the last plane is called the transverse plane which runs in this direction here. Now in that particular case we get more of a adduction or moving towards the centre of the body, and abduction, moving away from the body. Conversely, you can talk about internal rotation and external rotation of the upper leg as well, and that's motion in the transverse plane. Range of motion. Motion at the subtalar joint is normally two-thirds supination and one-third pronation. Both pronation and supination are triplanar motions comprised of the following elements pronation, eversion, abduction, and dorsiflexion, supination, inversion, adduction, and plantar flexion. The gait cycle. A prerequisite to understanding the role of the rear foot in gait is to understand gait. The gait cycle can be divided into two major phases. Stance, when the foot is in contact with the ground, and swing, when the foot is not in contact with the ground. The pathologies we see develop because of foot dysfunction during the stance phase. The major functional phases of the stance phase of gait are as follows. Contact phase. The contact phase begins with the heel strike on the outside edge of the heel. The tibia internally rotates and the foot pronates at the subtalar joint throughout the contact phase. The contact phase is designed to convert the foot into a mobile adapter and shock absorbing mechanism. The contact phase ends when the entire plantar surface of the foot is in contact with the ground. The mid stance phase. The mid-stance phase begins when the entire foot is flat on the ground and continues until the heel lifts off the ground again. During this phase, we need a stable but flexible platform from which to support the body. The mid-stance phase converts the foot from a mobile adapter into a rigid lever. During this phase, the tibia externally rotates and the foot supinates at the subtalar joint, preparing the foot for propulsive phase.
the propulsive phase. The propulsive phase begins when the heel lifts off the ground and continues until the apex of the hallux leaves the ground. Just prior to heel lift, the subtalar joint should approach the neutral position, whereby the forefoot and rear foot lock together to enable effective toe-off. The foot continues to supinate during toe-off with external tibial rotation. In propulsion, the limb is extended and can efficiently channel load to create forward motion. Rear foot function, part one, the ankle joint. There are two major joints in the rear foot. The first is the ankle. This video shows ankle joint function during the stance phase of gait. During the course of any step, the center of body mass must pass from behind the weight-bearing foot to in front of it. Ankle joint motion is very important during gait, and when we view subjects walking from the side, we can see these motions very clearly. Rear foot function, part two, the subtalar joint. The second major joint of concern is the subtalar joint. The terms pronation and supination are used to describe the motions taking place at the subtalar joint. It is important to focus on the motion that can be seen in the calcaneus with subtalar joint motion. In the photo on the left, the calcaneus is inverting, which indicates that the subtalar joint is supinating. In the photo on the right, the calcaneus is everting, which indicates that the subtalar joint is pronating. Inversion and eversion take place in the frontal plane and indicate only one component of subtalar joint motion. The normal lower limb and tibial varum factor. The normal lower limb is inverted approximately 4 degrees from the vertical. This is called a tibial varum and influences normal subtalar joint function. Tibial verum angle varies between individuals. Excess compensatory pronation. The tibial verum factor combined with the hard, flat, unnatural surfaces we walk on daily causes the feet to pronate excessively. The most common form of lower limb biomechanical dysfunction is excess pronation. Excess pronation at the subtalar joint commonly exhibits Calcaneal eversion, internal tibial rotation, lowering and elongation of the arch structure, excess weight bearing over the first metatarsophalangeal joint, excess medial lower limb strain. During the mid stance phase, the foot remains pronated and unlocked instead of re-supinating to a locked position, turning the foot into a rigid lever. The effect of excess pronation. The subtalar joint axis lies approximately halfway between the frontal and transverse planes, about 42 degrees in the sagittal plane. Therefore, for each degree of calcaneal eversion, frontal plane motion, we see an equal degree of internal tibial rotation, transverse plane motion. This is the all-important link between lower limb biomechanical function and upper body posture. The function of the subtalar joint. The importance of the subtalar joint arises from its unique orientation which allows it to convert foot rotation into leg rotation and leg rotation into foot rotation. An example is the differential in a car. It rotates on one plane, but converts motion into another plane sitting at a 90 degree angle. The subtalar joint can be thought of as a torque converter that converts limb rotations into foot motion and vice versa. The ideal lower limb. The ideal lower limb exhibits the following characteristics. A. Bisection of the lower one-third of the tibia is vertical. B. The knee, ankle and subtalar joint lie in transverse plane parallel to the supporting surface. C. The subtalar joint rests at neutral, i.e. no supination or pronation. D. The bisection of the calcaneus is vertical. E. The mid-tarsal joint is locked, maximally pronated, and the forefoot plantar plane aligns the rear foot plantar plane. Footprints. 
footprints in the sand show us a couple of interesting features. One, lateral strike. The footprint reflects the inverted heel strike pattern by having a deeper lateral indentation. Two, the footprints walk to a centre line, which effectively increases our functional strike angle. On hard surfaces, this means the foot has to pronate further to gain ground contact. Pronation, internal changes. The changes that are visible externally occur as a result of changes to the internal bony architecture. On the left is a supinated foot. The navicular on the medial aspect of the foot is higher than the calcaneus. The talus is adducting and dorsiflexing with supination. The photo on the right shows a pronated foot with the talus abducting and plantar flexing. These are the normal motions that occur with pronation and supination. The width of the foot changes between supination and pronation. The pronated foot is wider and we can see that the navicular lies more medial than normal. This in itself can be a problem and can cause the bulge in the medial aspect of footwear that is often seen in patients with an excessively pronated foot, prominent navicular. 